Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Palmer Emmett. He's a winemaker, and along with his partner, Michael Scorson, they head Emmett Scorson Wines. It's an artisan winery on the edge of Healdsburg, for those of you who know about the grape growing regions in Northern California. Joining me in this conversation with Palmer is Peter Crosby, who introduced us. Pete and his wife, Kathleen, are very dear friends of mine who first brought us for a tasting. And Palmer immediately captivated us, describing the care, wisdom, and style he put in every bottle. And if it sounds strange to you that we went to a wine tasting that was hosted by the winemaker, well, you're right. You don't get that at the big commercial wineries. And he was even able to point right at the vines on the hill where the grapes grew for each blend. It's a really special experience, and he and Michael are both fantastic, and you're about to hear that. This conversation happened a few weeks ago, right before hillsides within a mile of him were ravaged by fire. Their operation survived, but this season's grapes may have been tainted by the smoke. We're going to find out in a follow-up episode, so keep your eyes and ears out for it. Now, as we always do, we want to ask you to consider supporting our favorite charity, Save the Brave. You can read about them at savethebrave.org, and you can support them as we do with some money or some of your time. This episode is brought to you by Dynasec Protection, offering discreet protection services for the most discerning executives either at home or on the office campus. Clients include the most successful tech and investment firms and estates from Silicon Valley to Napa and Sonoma Valley, and you can reach out to them at dynasecprotection.com, that's D-Y-N-A-S-E-C, protection.com, or you can send me an email and we'll get you a complimentary assessment of your security risks and needs. You can get me at john at breakitdownshow.com. You can also get Pete at pete at breakitdownshow.com. And hey, we'll hook you up with whatever you need. We'd love to hear from you. Here's today's guest, winemaker, tastemaker, adventurer, Palmer Emmett. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Palmer Emmett from Emmett Scorson Wines, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed. Is this Healdsburg? This is Healdsburg, yes. Dry Creek Valley. Dry Creek Valley. Now, for our listeners who are elsewhere, I just want to say if there's anything that you find charming about Northern California, all of the things on the list that you find charming, they're all here. So if you don't know about this place. We're on a patio overlooking a vineyard next to a barn. That's right. <laughs> That's right. A barn where magic happens, yep. by the way. So, yeah. So It's pretty idyllic. Yeah. And Palmer is here because he makes wine. Yes, I do. How'd you get here? How far back do you want me to go? Well, let's go back to maybe the first time you tasted wine. I can't recall the, the first time, but, but definitely the first time that it kind of clicked for me that wine was something that, that I appreciated was was tasting wines with my father. Okay. He had a uh, a really nice cellar growing up that was something that was new wine was something to be revered. We had this beautiful cellar that you got to through a trap door in our dining room in our home and this says a lot. I didn't have a cellar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was not necessarily a or a trap door. <laughs> yeah, right. He was not necessarily a wine expert, but knew what he liked and collected wine, I think, partially because he enjoyed it, partially as an in- investment. He was a, a Wall Street guy. Yeah, Napa Cabernets first started to get some traction and become as revered as some of the wines in, in France. And so he, he collected both first growth Bordeaux. Where and, were you? And Napa Valley. We have to ask, where were you at Yeah, the time? I grew up, in, grew up in New Jersey. Okay. So we're talking about a, a, a Wall Street guy raising a family in New Jersey, but he knows about Napa wine. So you had an exposure pretty young yep. to an environment that here we take, we take for granted. So please continue. Yeah. And then we would, uh, we would take trips every year in the spring. We'd do a ski trip with my dad and myself and, and a bunch of his buddies. And there would be some, some pretty, some pretty rowdy dinners with those guys. And there'd always be a bunch of wine going around the table. And 
when I turned 21, I got to got to share in the, in the, the ritual. Wine. Yeah. yeah, not not until you were 21. <laughs> right, well, right yeah, on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Never <laughs> Maybe before. Maybe a day or two before. The first wine that really kind of clicked for me was was an Oregon Pinot Noir. Just kind of that, you know, people talk about their aha moment in wine, and mine was a, an Oregon Pinot. So from then on, every time I was out with my father, he would let me choose a a wine off the list. Uh, usually choose a, a Pinot, sometimes from Oregon. He, he started to try to teach me what little he knew about wine, that the ancestral home of Pinot Noir was was Burgundy in France. So we started ordering some red Burgundies, some Pinot Noirs from this area of California, Sonoma County. And I just kind of learned by tasting with my father and, and drinking drinking with him. And I'd order the Pinot. He'd order something that he liked, a Cab or a Bordeaux. And we'd trade talk notes. about it and yeah. trade notes. And, yeah. and that's where I first started kind of gaining that appreciation for wine. Okay. Where'd you get your education? So so the, the next kind of step in my wine appreciation, I was living in Southern California, moved to LA. Yeah. Never mind your wine education for a moment. Yeah. Where'd you get your education? I'm what you might call the overeducated and underskilled. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll be the judge of that. Yeah. Did my undergrad at Bowdoin College in Maine, liberal arts college, but I, I majored in mathematics, but I took quite a few other interesting courses. Uh, I took a lot of film studies classes, which led me to uh, apply to NYU for grad school. I got a master of arts at Tisch School of the Arts in cinema studies. All right. Worked in the movie business for about a decade, and during What'd that you do? time, fell in love with wine, and and uh, eventually made my way here. The movie places, the movie business, is a good place to be familiar with wine because there are a lot of wine appreciators. In you know, there are a lot of wine appreciators in artistic environments, but certainly yeah. in the movie business, if you're in the profitable part of the movie business, people can afford to drink good wine. So. Yeah. When you were, let's talk about your experience working in Hollywood for a decade. What, um, uh, first of all, what'd you work on? What did you do? So I started out doing freelance production work, whatever jobs I could whatever get. Whatever production work yeah, was there. I worked yeah. on some, you know, some small independent films. I worked on a television pilot that did not get picked up. I worked on a a straight to home video movie called MVP2 Most Vertical Primate by the makers of Air Bud about a chimpanzee <laughs> that plays ice hockey Terrific. and skateboards. This is great. I worked on a little movie called Cellular, which was kind of this B action thriller with uh, Jason Statham played the the villain and Kim Basinger played the damsel in distress and Chris Evans was the uh, was the hero. There were a couple of great character actors in it, Bill Macy and Noah Emmerich and uh, Jessica Biel was in it. Um, <laughs> oh man, I love this cast. Yeah. yeah. How did this movie? Now, go, now where, I have to look for. Yeah, things. where did this movie go wrong? So it's funny. I had this this buddy of mine that I worked with in the film business that I I really respected his opinion. Really smart guy named Cooper Samuelson. He sent out this uh, this list to all of his friends in the movie business of his top ten movies of two thousand two and yeah and Cellular was on his list <laughs> and I remember to this day the exact wording his description of the movie. He said, "This is the best pure B movie." ever made. If you found this in a vault and were told that Hitchcock had made it, you'd say it was better than North by Northwest. <laughs> that is a, that's an wow. amazing review. Wow. That's and, terrific. And the, uh, like it's a B action thriller written by this guy, Larry Cohen, who's kind of famous for writing these concept thrillers. He also wrote phone booth. I love the concept thriller. Yeah. yeah. The, the idea of this one being that Kim Basinger is kidnapped, trapped in an attic, She's a high school science teacher. So when Jason Statham smashes the telephone in there so that she can't call out to get help, she's able to piece the phone back together wow. piece by piece, uh -huh. but can't assemble the dial. So she can get a dial tone and just kind of tap out electronic signals. Okay. And she gets randomly, she doesn't know what phone number she's getting, but she reaches this surfer dude on his cell phone. And it's Chris Evans. It is Chris Evans. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. <laughs> what? You're talking crazy. I didn't hear that. <laughs> and then after that... We should disclose, I've made a couple terrible movies that never went anywhere. Uh -huh. I might have been an action star in Thailand for about six months, and Pete went to film school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right on. So we're not strangers to the industry. We yeah. didn't get as far as you did. Yeah. And then after that, I worked on... Uh, the only other movie I worked on you might have heard of was called... I'm blanking on the name because it had a different title when I was working on it. It was called The Untitled uh. Ted Griffin Project. And then um, it was kind of the unofficial sequel to The Graduate, 
Kevin Costner and Jennifer Aniston. Hmm. Kevin Costner plays the kind of continuation yeah, the, of the of the uh, Dustin Hoffman role. Uh, Shirley MacLaine plays Mrs. Robinson. Wow! Um, wow! And and the the premise of that movie is that Kevin Costner now twenty years later, twenty five years later, um, is dating. Has a uh, May December romance the other direction. The other direction. So yeah. he's now he's now hooked up with three women in three <laughs> in the same family, three different generations. Wow, nice work if you can get it. Yeah. That's like Rumor has it. Rumor has it was the name of the film. Rumor has yeah. it. The only you know, when you think about somebody with a relationship with in the family three di three generations, I immediately think Motley Crew. Hmm. That's just where my mind goes. Like who gets away with that? Oh yeah. Probably Tommy Lee got away with that. Anyway, um, so you work a decade in the movie business. Yeah, and sorry, just to finish my my kind of bleak resume in the movie business after that was the last of my uh, kind of freelance production jobs. And then I, I landed at Disney working for a feature film producer who had a first look deal there uh, named Joe Farrell, who was a former market research executive. And I, and I worked there as one of his junior creative executives for, for five years before I, uh, before I left the business. Wow. So, um, something notable about that though, yeah. is that you can have a decade of making a living in the movie business mm -hmm. and you worked on a movie that we heard of sort of, and a couple <laughs> other projects that mm -hmm. were probably a lot of fun, but you can have a decade worth yeah. of a movie, you know, business career mm -hmm. and never you know, run into a fastball over the plate. You know, and I worked um, for this producer at at Disney for five years, and we made zero movies wow. during that time. Wow. <laughs> I, I you know, I, I what did you do? What did you do at so Disney? So much work yeah. on not making movies. Yeah, <laughs> so I try to explain my 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 job to people this way is that you know I would have to read ten scripts to find one that I liked. Uh -huh. I would have to find ten that I liked to find one that my bosses liked. Yeah, they'd have to find ten that they liked to find one that the studio would buy uh -huh. and the studio would buy 10 scripts for every movie they made. So that would mean I'd have to read 10,000 scripts to get a single movie made. <laughs> perfect. That is a perfect description. Wow. And so, that yeah, I was, so I was, uh, you know, creative executive, which basically is the first line of defense, you mm -hmm. know, so I had to read all the material that came in and then I worked with, worked with writers to try to develop, uh, ideas, um, into screenplays and try to pitch them to the studio to, to get them sold and hopefully eventually get the get one on the slate yeah. yeah because when you're working for the disney the disney operation makes more movies than most other operations but even a big motion picture studio it, makes it used to but yeah yeah i mean <laughs> right now who knows where where it's all going to go but at its peak a big motion picture studio would make you know 10 movies a year mm -hmm. Yeah, and, more, and people yeah. don't really do the math on the number of movies actually get made versus the great idea that you have for a story. And boy, if I could get this in the hands of, mm -hmm. you know, whoever. Well, and it's funny though. I mean, people say, oh, it's, I just need that one big idea. It's like every idea you've had, uh -huh. six guys in town already have. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's. Right. And five of those guys one, wrote execution. something. Yeah. One, you know, first of all, it's execution. How well can you execute it? And second of all, it's getting it in the right hands of, yep. of the right people at the right, at the right time. Yep. You know? That's the running into the fastball over the plate factor. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So after 10 years of that, you decided to come up here. Yeah. So very shortly. Into Glad my, you made it, it up here, by the way. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, was that more, were you done with the wine industry or done with the movie industry and ready to do this or. Been done with the the movie industry, even if you didn't have this to go to. It was a little bit of both. I I started in the, very early on in my time there. I was introduced to a friend of a friend who was a winemaker up here, and I started taking a lot of trips up here to uh, to taste wine and learn more about wine. And eventually started taking classes at night after work to get certified as a sommelier, just for fun at first. Started writing a wine blog. Started organizing uh, these monthly wine tasting parties for all my friends movie business in LA. And kind of before I knew it, I had built up this professional level of wine knowledge, again, just as a hobby at first. But yeah. Then, and uh, with a bit of a following. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I kind of, you know, became for, to a certain subset of, of, uh, Hollywood people, my age, I was the wine, I was the wine guy, you know? Yeah. Eventually, you know, we, for five years at Disney, uh, didn't get any movies made. And so eventually the first look deal the studio for our company was going away and with it, my job. And I kind of had this, you know, come to Jesus moment. Do I really want to fight my way back into the movie business? Mm -hmm. 
again or should I give this wine thing a go? And, yeah. And I was, you know, really, really passionate about wine and, and thought that uh, I'd see where it was going to take me. You had no vineyards or land purchased yet, you know. No, nothing. No. Nothing, just no. And I, go. you know, and at first I wasn't really sure um, if I was even going to move move up here. I took a job as a sommelier for a ski resort at Lake Tahoe, the Royal Gorge Resort, that <laughs> had two mountain lodges on the property, and I did the wine list for both of those lodges. And I was okay. kind of going back and forth between Tahoe and L.A. Yeah. For a while, and then I found out that Sonoma State had started this new graduate program, Wine MBA, MBA with a focus in the wine wine industry. And I thought, wow, that that sounds like it was kind of made for me. So uh, on to your second postgraduate degree. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I moved up here thinking, okay, I'm going to get this wine MBA, and then I'll probably go back to LA and do something, either you know, be sommelier to the stars or. Or, I'm going to be sommelier to the stars. You'll you see. Know. Yeah. Still get that dream, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, or, or continue, continue writing about wine, maybe open a little wine bar or a little wine shop. I really did not have any preconceived notions about where it was going to go, but mm -hmm. I had this buddy of mine, friend of a friend who I had known for five or six years, who was a winemaker up here, Michael Scorsone. We started spending some time together when I moved up here. And after a couple of months, he said, hey, do you want to make some wine together? And and I said, fuck yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting five years for you to ask me that. All right. Yeah. So he had already been making wine. Yeah. He went to culinary school and after that got his degree at UNLV, food and beverage management, and then moved to Napa, got a harvest job, just stuck around and worked his way up and got his first head wine making job, I think um, 2000, 2008 at Adobe Road. So when I moved up here, he had been working at Adobe Road for a couple of years, and he had made a deal with them that he could make a little bit of his own wine on the side. Okay. And so he said, hey, you buy the grapes, and uh, I'll make the wine, and we'll be partners, you know? And I don't think either of us at the beginning knew that it would evolve into what it's become. We just thought it'd be a fun side project. and mm. and uh, Yeah, you're just horsing around. Yeah made 200 cases that that first year was which is probably more than we should have made ah. and then just kind of worked together the the second year i had kind of a slow let's talk about the 200 cases yeah. that you made though because yeah. you say it was probably more than you should have made <laughs> yeah what did you learn from that that makes you say that what now? year was this also 2011 2011 was our first, first vintage. yeah okay made one wine the bexoffer george's third napa valley cabernet okay eight, made eight barrels how to, yeah. how to come out it came out great. And, you know, it was funny, 2011, as wine geeks know, has kind of been maligned. Maligned. Yeah, exactly. As a vintage, hmm. because it was a cooler, wetter year than is normal for Napa Valley. So the wines kind of are a little bit more like Bordeaux than they are than they are Napa. And they really weren't that big, rich, sweet, intense fruit in their youth that you expect from Napa Cab. But the wines have have evolved in a way that now everybody is is chasing 2011s because wow. the wines wow. are aging terrifically Terrific. we yeah. have, but, we have several of them. but we were slow to get get our our compliance in shape and our marketing in shape and 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 licensing and everything to release the wine that by the time we released it everyone had decided it was a bad vintage it, and nobody yeah, that and was, nobody you wanted 2011 you released it mid malign <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah you want to be first to market in a bad vintage you know <laughs> yeah right get these out of here before everybody notices yeah. now and, now do you have any of those left yeah we do we have we have about 10 cases left we've been very what? it was funny for for a couple of years hmm. anybody who who wanted it we were like Please. yeah we'll give you a deal on a case take yeah. it take it take it and we have a half a dozen people who bought more than five cases and a couple that bought more than 10 cases just right. like for personal consumption. And, and now you're going, huh? Yeah. So and, and, something yeah, and now we, yeah. And now we doubled the price because we have such, <laughs> such yeah. a small amount Scarcity of now. left and it's, and it's so good and everyone wants it. So, okay. yeah. so at the time you thought, well, you would, maybe we shouldn't have made all these cases. It all comes out in the wash. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have, you know, Cabernet certainly, is age worthy so you have time to sell it but vintage after vintage inventory starts to pile up yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah so in general anything you make you you want to you want to sell it within a year of releasing it or or you made too much you know mm -hmm. wow maybe you make a decision at the beginning like okay we're going to hold back five percent for our for our library yeah you know but 
other than that, you don't want to be sitting on a bunch of wine, even if it's wine that'll age well, because it just, it compounds and compounds and compounds. Yeah. That's how people get into trouble in this business, especially with something like Cabernet that, you know, you're producing it today and you're not going to sell it for three or four years. So you have right. to predict your sales three or four years in advance, which is <laughs> really. Which is part of why an MBA becomes necessary. <laughs> yeah. 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 People ask me, what's the biggest challenge? That's it right there. Managing, you know, managing the inventory, figuring out how much wine to make. The forecasting. Cause, cause, yeah. Making too much is a problem. Not making enough is a problem too. Right. <laughs> wow. Know? So how much did you make last year? We'll see once it all gets bottled exactly how much it turns out to be, but estimates based on the crop is about 2,800 cases. Wow. Now this is for both uh, the Palmer and the... Correct. Course, huh? Yeah. Domenica Amato, Domenica, which is our, yeah. our brand where we do uh, Rhone varieties and Mediterranean Italian 2, varieties. 2,800 cases. That's just not a lot. That is so, not a lot. You know... It I doesn't was... sound like a lot, but for two guys in a barn, it's uh, yeah. it's a lot of wine. <laughs> well, okay. So for our listeners, I don't think we've yeah. revealed that what we're doing here and why this is so special is because you are two guys in a barn in this idyllic location. And it's unfortunate for our listeners that they can't see what we're seeing because we are sitting on a patio overlooking a vineyard. And this is just amazing. This view is idyllic and yeah. it's it's a storybook setting yep. and it's two guys making 2,800 cases of wine mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. It's just a, you know, there's, you guys are the definition of boutique. Yep. Yeah. And again, I say, if there's anything that you find charming about Northern California, mm -hmm. everything on that list is right here in this spot. Yep. Well, it's kind of a combination of that and the experience that we hope to provide to people here is is the one that you hear about when people come back from a trip to yeah. Tuscany, Yeah, you know, yeah. and they said, I ju we just kind of pulled up this driveway and we didn't really know where we were. And this guy came out of this barn and he didn't speak English, but he invited us <laughs> in and he right. poured us all this wine and it was yeah. amazing and it was the most fun I ever had. And, mm -hmm. and so we kind of wanted to do that. And there was nobody else there. Yeah. And so that's, that's the experience we hope to provide to people. Like the yeah. key word is authenticity and, and yeah. it, what you see is what you get. It's literally Michael and I, in these two barns, making the wine, selling the wine, we have we have no employees, we have no investors, um, no consultants. It's literally just the two of us, and it's funny. I can say that exact thing to people sitting here at a tasting, and then twenty minutes later they say, "Who's your winemaker?" <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, because that's kind of the culture here. Is like yeah, there's just... this rock star winemaker who's like this mythical creature. That's just not a, that's just not us. Yeah, yeah. yeah I tell people that you know there. are there's more places like this here in Sonoma than Napa. It's just, you know, it's something you find in Sonoma more often. And this is what wine tasting is. It's not standing in a bar four people deep. Right. Trying to get your order in. Yes. You know, that's how most of us started with wine tasting is you went to a bar and you stood. To, so to sit in seats with this kind of view. And then you tasted and, and there were people behind you yep. and you knew there were people behind you. Yep. Well, and the guy pouring the five, wine yeah. doesn't know the first thing about making it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The winemaker very well may be pouring or, or Palmer and, and they, you know, they own the company, they know the wine and, and you just have this view and, and this is what it's about. This yeah. is what you go home and tell other people about. Yeah. And we, you know, we didn't, we didn't start with a billion dollars. The, the kind of classic uh, trope is how do you make a small fortune in the wine business? You start, start with, with a large, large fortune. fortune. <laughs> and, you know, we started with very little. We leased this property. We got very lucky to find it. Yeah, very lucky to be able to make wine here. Most guys um, doing what we're doing without a billion dollars trying to make it on their own. They're making wine in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. So we got very lucky that we found this couple that lives on this beautiful property and was willing to lease us the, the winery space and partner with us on, on growing the grapes here spectacular what an arrangement yeah it is truly magical and people ask you know what's the kind of what are your long-term goals and our long-term goals are, are basically to do exactly what we're doing now except eventually buy the buy the property from our landlords hmm. you know and that's yeah. pretty much it you don't you want know? to grow and have distributed in europe and yeah definitely not in europe we're doing a little bit of distribution you know and i think eventually at some point we might look to get a warehouse space to make a little bit more wine because mm -hmm. we're limited here. It's literally just two barns and yeah, it's permitted, this, permitted this for 3000 cases. And even that is, is a bit of a stretch here. Mm. So eventually if we grow a little bit, we might want to make the wine somewhere else, but, um, or at least some of the wine somewhere else, but we want to stay small enough where we still have a, a personal connection to, to all mm -hmm. the wines, to all the customers, you know, to everybody that's opening a bottle, you know, they, 
they, they know us. Yeah. Well, we had that experience. We were lucky enough to come uh, for a tasting with Pete, co-host Pete. This is Pete Crosby, who we reference on the show. Now, my permanent co-host is Pete Turner, who lives in Orange County. And we refer to Pete Crosby as the other Pete. Other Pete. Yep. Except when I'm at Pete Crosby's house, we refer to Pete Turner as other Pete. <laughs> but That's cool. Yeah. We, um, we came up uh, last weekend and sat here in these Adirondack chairs and mm-hmm. looked at this vineyard. And you brought up some bottles and we were tasting. And the bottle that I looked at said Judge Palmer on it. And I said, isn't that Palmer? And Pete said, yeah. And I thought, okay, this is terrific. This is the best right here. This is the connection that you're talking about. And then you started talking about making the wine and it was such an intimate conversation about the nuances in the winemaking process that it made that, it made every, every taste so much more significant because you talked about every small piece of things that nobody in a tasting room who's pouring could ever begin to talk about. And it just, it was just so much fun. It was just a lot of fun. Yeah. I learned everything I have from coming to small places like this where you just really can just, they have a lot of knowledge and I've never read a book. I don't know any, I I wouldn't say I know anything about wine, but anything I know, I learned from people who make wine at their wineries. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great thing about Sonoma. Yeah. But we're here at the most special place in Sonoma. <laughs> yeah. The most special one. You know, we try to do, our guest list is long and varied, and we're very lucky to talk to people who do interesting things. But we haven't had, I'm trying to think if we've had another winemaker on the show. Hmm. I don't know that we have. You may be the first. All right. right? Yeah. So uh, you, you guys do a Pinot, right? We've done a Pinot in the past. We're, we're not currently. Okay. Michael... Okay kind of cut his teeth making Pinot Noir. He was the assistant winemaker at Fela for a long time. They make quite a few different, really spectacular single vineyard Pinots out on the Sonoma Coast and Russian River Valley and elsewhere. So when I first met him, that was what I was really into and that's mm-hmm. what he was making. Yeah. Did you want to make an Oregon style? We could say, because the first wine you might've tasted, was there you know, I, a draw to that? Kind of our philosophy in, in winemaking is that you can only make an Oregon style Pinot in Oregon. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, what's happened with the, with the Sonoma coast, the, the really prime areas where Michael was making wine from, they've become so sought after that the, if you're, if you're buying the grapes, which is the position we're in, cause we don't own the vineyard, you really have to pay a, a big premium, um, uh, for the grapes. And so it just became financially a little, a little tough for us to kind of stay in the Pinot game. And we sort of believe that if you're going to do Pinot, well, you should probably just stick to Pinot. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and we wanted to do a bunch of different, bunch of different things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we may we may do one on a one off if we get an opportunity to get do some it. grapes one year from yeah. a really special vineyard at a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. Then we then we'd do it again. But so lightning, Michael makes really special lightning Pinots. strike four times yeah. in the same place. That can exactly, be, yeah. exactly, yeah. So, but we're talking about a business model that is centered around doing something. The absolute best. Right. No compromise as far as quality is. is that concerned. is spectacular. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing better than that, except to be able to do it here on this vineyard yeah. in a barn. <laughs> you know? Do you live here? Uh, I live just down the road in Santa Rosa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. What and a Michael, commute, And Michael lives down in the town of Sonoma. So mm-hmm. I was living in San Francisco for, for a few years well, and, and commuting out mm-hmm. here to this spot. And that was... Uh, <laughs> that was a little rough, but yeah. now, That's a chunk. Now, now I'm in Sonoma County and yeah. a lot happier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I bet. So when you made the move up here, what were your, you have a family now. I do. What was your marital status when you moved up here? Did you have? I was recently divorced, uh-huh. which was, you know, one of the reasons I was willing to make this big mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. life change. And I had started dating my, my now wife, Heather. Uh-huh. And so I moved up here and. You know, when, at the time I moved up here, we had just started dating and I was just getting out of this divorce. So it wasn't, I, we weren't really thinking she needs to quit her life and move up here. Yeah. Also because I didn't really know that I was going to stay permanently. Yeah. So there was just a lot of, it was the right amount of, we're just figuring all this right, out. Right. But we very quickly realized we did not want to be 
apart. And so she followed me up here six months later and we got engaged. Did she realize when she got here that it it ain't so bad up here? Uh, Yeah. Kind of, kind of the opposite. Oh no. She was happy with me, but not, it didn't stick at Sonoma County. It was a big, big change. Sleepy Sonoma County from the lifestyle that we had, Mm -hmm. you know, in the movie business in LA. And so the compromise was, was San Francisco. So that's why we moved from Sonoma to SF. And then when we started our family, then started to make a lot more sense to be to be out here closer to the winery and yeah so what years were you in the in the city i was there from um october of 2013 mm-hmm. to uh march of 2019 and how did you like it during those years i loved it yeah, yeah. i lived there for 10 years and I, I liked it it was great yeah was... we lived in the marina district mm-hmm. um which is a oh, great place not... to live yeah, and, great place to and live. really easy in and out mm-hmm. um it's kind of the perfect balance for me of you know didn't really have any of the drawbacks of urban living right. just kind of had all the positives like all i could walk to like really nice bars Great and restaurants, restaurants. Yeah. yeah and i could walk to the beach i mean you know san francisco is not exactly beach weather but you know it i could go for a, a run could yeah. go for a run along the water to the right. golden gate bridge and right. back you know five and if miles. you like sailboats yep you know it's great to look at sailboats right there they're for our listeners who are not around here because there are a lot of a lot of our listeners aren't aren't close by that commute is I mean, it must have taken you an hour and a half to get here every day. Um, sometimes it would take me, sometimes uh, it's 72 miles. So Holy if there's no traffic, it was like an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so rush was, hour, yeah. rush hour in the morning, it was about an hour and 20. Yeah. In the evening, could it, could if I left like right at the worst rush, it could be like an hour and 45. Yeah. So that that gives it some context. It's great to live in the marina if yep. if you uh, love San Francisco. But where are you going? I, the, the oh, you want to get out of the sun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and if you don't have kids, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but as soon as we we had kids, then you know, I, I needed to be home more. You know? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it's not you know it's a, this is a nice place I think to to raise a family in in California. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Right. So with this arrangement here, um, tell us about what's growing. We're on a hillside that sort of faces. Yes, yeah, so we kind of have this. Right? This um, so the that that steep hillside all the way in the back that faces west southwest west, southwest. Okay. So we're looking this way, kind of east northeast. Got it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it gets a lot that, of sun. And up on that kind of steep hillside, all the way at the far end of the vineyard there. Uh, the terrace block, we have Cabernet Sauvignon growing, and we make a single vineyard wine uh, just from those vines on the hillside. It only makes about 100 cases or so a year, but it makes a completely different character of, sal- of uh, Cabernet from, uh, from the rest of the, the grapes in the vineyard because of that steep hillside, the exposure to the sun, the drainage, mm-hmm. um, the soil, um, totally different character of wine, much more concentrated, intense. Uh, and then... Everything to the left of us here in this swale that kind of runs between us uh, and that terraced hillside, everything to the left is more Cabernet. Everything to the right, the longer rows is Grenache. There's a little bit more Cabernet in the far corner there on the opposite side of the pond. And then on this side of the pond, this tucked away corner here is Petite Syrah. Ah. And then behind us on the hillside uh, up by up by the house is uh, more Cab- another acre or so of Cabernet. Wow. Honey, honey, do we have any of their Petite Syrah? We have not done a, uh, a single varietal Petite Syrah. Oh, okay, We've okay. only done it in a blend I so got far. It, got it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Not, not enough. It, it makes, um, we get about two tons from that little Petite Syrah mm-hmm. block, which we get, you know, four or five barrels of wine. But it's the reason we grow it is for blending. It's such a great blending grapes so we use it in a couple of different blends we use it in some of the cabs mm-hmm. we use it in in the grenache we use it in our estate red blend that blends all three together mm-hmm. yeah. terrific and actually when we came here all the grenache and petite syrah um was syrah and we made the decision a couple of years ago to, to graft these vines over mm-hmm. uh to grenache and petite syrah because we felt like the the uh, climate here and the soil was better suited to to Grenache. Yeah. So even though you're leasing this land, your arrangement with your landlord is yes. that you're controlling what's growing here. 
Yeah, we, we, we partner on the vineyard, you know, and we told them early on that we were... You had intentions. We were interested in the Cabernet. I see. Um, but the Syrah was going to be a tougher sell. You know, we, we, we said, you know, we, we might be able to find a slot in our lineup when we, you know, sh- ship wine to our wine club members um, where we could make 100 cases of it and be pretty confident that we could sell it. But they were getting enough Syrah here to make you know, 10 times that. Hmm. And there was just, there is no <laughs> market for Syrah really. Um, especially, you know, warmer climate Syrah it just wasn't our business. It wasn't something we wanted to, to tackle. And we didn't really, we thought it made good wine, but not world-class wine. Yeah. Um, so it was a compromise. And so we said, you know, you're going to have the, the market for Syrah being what it is, you're going to have a really hard time selling the rest of the grapes that we don't buy. But if you bud this over to Grenache for us, we'll commit to buying the whole vineyard. Hmm. Wow. Um, to buying all the grapes. And so that's what they did. It, you know, it was a little bit of a of a cost for them to to get the grafting done. And then that first year we suffered a bit in terms of the uh um the yield. Yeah. But they've since then more than made up for their initial investment because the Grenache, you know, we agreed to pay a county average price and the Grenache gets 50% more and it yields quite a bit more than the Syrah did. It's a hardier vine. So, mm, terrific. so they've already, they've already made up the difference of their wow. investment. So you guys are a great vineyard partner. Yeah. Yeah. I, we think so. Yeah. yeah. And you do do a full Grenache though. We do. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what are your intentions for as, you know, if, if you're looking ahead to what you're going to do with this, um, with this operation and the wines that you sort of aspire to make and yep. what you want to do to rotate, um, you know, what's growing out here. Is that, is that a factor? I mean, that's a lot to balance. You're talking about what, you know, proportions of this land you have, which is great in your description, but it is a finite amount of land. Yeah. You're only going to get so many grapes out. Yeah. Of it. And it produces about, um, about half of our production comes from the estate vineyard and then half comes from grapes from that we purchase buying. from elsewhere. And, yeah. um, again, that's part of our philosophy. You know, if you have one particular uh, plot of land with with a soil type and a climate type, you're going to be able to make, you know, one, two, maybe three mm-hmm. kind of world-class wines if you really dial it in. Wow. But we, we want to make 12 world-class wines. Yeah. Um, so and you have so, to look elsewhere. And so we're looking elsewhere, you know, and so we're getting, we're making the Cabernet that grows here, but we're also uh, exploring different expressions of Cabernet vineyards from Napa Valley, from Alexander Valley. So we make, depending on the year, four or five different Cabernets. Um, we make a bunch of white wines. We don't have any white grapes growing here. So we're sourcing white grapes from a bunch of different uh, cooler climate spots than what we have here in Dry Creek Valley. So in Sonoma County, that generally means either up in the mountains or out closer to the coast or down south uh, by the bay in Carneros. All of those places have have uh, cooling influences and in, in did the you get some grapes there. from Monterey too? We have not done anything oh, okay. from Monterey, but we do the Fiano from uh, from Clarksburg outside of Sacramento. Hmm. That's the only uh, non Sonoma Napa uh, wine that we've that we've made. Wow. Okay. What do you so, see? So yeah. So long term, just to finish um, answering your question, we um, you know we want to continue to make better and better wines from this property. Dial in, dial in the farming. Um, dial in the, the proper blends for the blend we want to make. And then eventually we'd, we'd like to maybe consider getting some white grapes in here that'll do well. It's like I said, it's a little hard in these warmer climate spots to make a world-class white, but there are certain grapes that, that can do it. Some of the Rhone and Italian grapes. So we'd like to plant this hmm. uh, block up here to some sort of a white field blend that kind of expresses Michael's uh, Italian heritage and, hmm. and something that is going to be hopefully very unique to us because there's not a lot of people growing those grapes here now you you do a field blend too right now right now do you have one we do yeah we blend we decided to blend even though they're not kind of typically blended together cabernet petite Syrah, and grenache because they're growing here it's an expression of of our land of our place that's unique to us so we decided to do uh to do the blend of those three grapes and talk a little bit about a field blend how it's different than other blends yeah so i mean ours it's it's not kind of technically a field blend but it but it sort of is uh historically um in california especially when vineyards were first planted here you know 150 years ago um one of the ways that you could um 
kind of hedge your bets from year to year of a of a good or a bad vintage or to make a to make a balanced wine is to plant a bunch of different varieties side by side in the same vineyard and just pick all the grapes together. They're all going to ripen a little bit differently, have have good years, bad years. Some are going to have more sugar, some more acid, some more flavor, some more uh, tannin. Uh, but generally, you can get a, a somewhat consistent um, result if you have uh, all those different grapes growing together in a field. So there's a lot of historic vineyards in California that are those those kind of field field blends. And the, but also they would it would all go. Th- be processed at the same time and, and aged right. in the same barrel. Right, right? exactly. So, sometimes you'll blend wines that are aging in two separate right. barrels. And that, that's the one way in which the wine we make here is is somewhat like a field blend, and that is, well, one, they're growing in the same place. Two, we ferment them together. Yeah. You know, whereas mostly with blends, you're picking the grapes separately because they're ripening at different rates mm-hmm. um, and fermenting them separately. And then in a lot of cases, aging them separately yeah. too yeah. and just yeah. assembling a blend right before bottling. And mm-hmm. this is kind of, becomes its own thing immediately. We harvest the grapes, crush them together in the same tank, and mm-hmm. and uh, they ferment together, age together. It just seems like more fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's got to be an older style, right? You know, yeah. I mean, way back before, yeah. you know, and, and the, the vessels were very precious and expensive probably, so just put the grapes together. I mean, the first guy to blend just before bottling probably got the, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so. Well, you know, historically, so many of the great wines of the world our blends. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of a um, really a Californian invention of the last kind of 60 or 70 years to label wines with the name of the grape variety mm-hmm. on them. In Europe, you see even the wines that are Rhone mono varietal, they have the name of the village on them or the mm-hmm. name of the vineyard or the name of the town. They don't, they don't have Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> wow. You know? That's pretty cool. Because wine is about is about a place. You know, it's about a place. You know, yeah. if you if you really get kind of deeply mm-hmm. into fine wine, you realize that it's uh, it's an expression of uh, of the place. You know, that's that's what the this French word terroir means, and that's what kind of all you know really serious winemakers are after that kind of pure expression of of the of the place of the soil of the climate uh, that's unique to each uh, each plot of of land. That's that's probably why it's such a big part of the sommelier education to be able to identify regions, right? Absolutely, yeah, a hundred percent. And and for me, that's that's so much of the fun is how wine is kind of tied to, you know, history and geography and and culture in all these interesting ways. And, so, and you can learn so much about a place by by uh, by the wines that come out of there, or the food that come out of there. Yeah. yeah. So can you? at least in some circumstances, identify a wine down to the row of the vineyard? Hmm. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, there definitely are people that can, especially mm-hmm. if you're, you know, a French winemaker who's who's growing Pinot Noir in mm-hmm. a lot of those different spots and you have 30 years of experience doing them and you're fermenting them all separately every year, yeah. then I'm sure you can. Mm-hmm. I mean, the extent to which a, uh, just a sommelier, just based on, their palate. Can walk up to a bottle with their palate yeah. and nothing else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really depends certainly on, on the talent, but a lot is based on the experience. You know, if they've mm-hmm. tasted that wine over and over again, yeah. then yes, they can. But just kind of blind, mm-hmm. you They're know, to, yeah, yeah it, it takes a lot of kind of practice and There's a lot of variable. And tasting. There's a lot of drinking involved in that. Yeah. A lot <laughs> of, that's that's yeah. the only thing you yeah. do is be a Somali. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, thing. there is a, what they call the systematic approach to tasting, a way that you you learn to taste so that you are able to recognize those things. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it can be taught. A lot of it is is innate ability, but so much of it is experience. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so people ask me, you know, they're like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna test you. We want to pour your own wines for you blind. Mm. You think you'll be able to figure them out? I'm like, yeah, my own wines? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just just yeah. just out of pure familiarity. Yeah. What about the consumer trends i mean we seem to be drinking a lot more wine now that we're in quarantine land yep and in this circumstance it seems like people who are drinking more wine you can go two directions you can either drink more wine and appreciate wine a little more and in a little more detail or you can just drink more wine yep and spend a little more time drunk (laughs) Um, what are you seeing and what do you think if you're predicting the future how much how much more appreciating do you think we're going to do? I think I think we're doing a lot more appreciating, and and I think the reason why is for me, fine wine, 
always goes with food. Mm -hmm. And I think so many more people in this quarantine are enjoying wine with dinner every night. And I think that's really the best way to not only enjoy wine, but, but to learn more about it. Then they'll so, go out and order a glass of wine at a restaurant yep. and the next time exactly. they can do it. And um, yep. yeah, the, the whole food, they've, they've driven each other, but the, the food revolution has fueled the craft cocktail revolution, sure. you know, just the, just fresh ingredients. It doesn't have to be fancy, yep. but not a sweet and sour mix. Get two limes, yeah. just squeeze them. It takes a few extra seconds, and now you put a one in front of the price of the drink. An $8 <laughs> drink becomes $18. That's yes, it. Yes. Get, get an edible flower, one of them, boom, $18. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the other things that, I, that I'm seeing, um, which has been kind of surprising to me, and this is not a, a recent kind of summer phenomenon. This was happening in, in March. We're selling a lot more white wine. Hmm. And I think normally... Men don't drink a lot of white wine, especially, well, I think anywhere, um, home or in a restaurant environment, they generally order red. Mm -hmm. And now I think men are stuck at home with their wives and they're drinking the white wines. And discovering Along with their wines and discovering how how great white wine can be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I hope that opens it up. Yeah, me too. Because I I love, uh, I love white wine. I love the, the kind of, you know vast realm in between Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. I don't mm-hmm. drink very much of either of those two things. We make a little bit of both, but what we really love is, you know, Grenache Blanc and Fiano and Vermentino and Vignet and um, all these fun uh, Rhone and Italian and Alsatian varietals that make really terrific wine that most people are just not familiar with because mm-hmm. they're just stuck in the Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, mm-hmm. maybe Pinot Grigio. They've heard of Riesling. They don't like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's it. They, they all, you know? they're, they're not all uh, sweet, but they, they all think they are. Yeah. Making white wines masculine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love white wine. Yeah. Especially, you know, and, and here now, summer is really August through the beginning of October. That's what summer is now. Used to be, ju- you know, June, July, August, yeah. and, you know, a little bit of September. Now it's kind of moved over. So, um, Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I guess it depends on 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 exactly where you live in the Bay. The, the weather can be so different if That's you're true. in yeah. San Francisco or oh, yeah, yeah. or yeah. you know or Petaluma or Santa Rosa or Healdsburg. You know, totally different different weather. Um, Climates are very micro. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Yeah. You know what, though, I want to get back to your eighteen dollar cocktail um, because I didn't want—I <laughs> don't want our listeners to hear that and think you're making light of that because you throw an edible flower in there and then mm-hmm. you you move the mm-hmm. you you put a one in front of the price of the drink. But a lot of that means that you've used fresh ingredients and you make the drink worth eighteen dollars. Yes. Well, they're all fresh made. Yeah. Every element of it is fresh made. I remember the first time I had a fresh made cocktail. How impressed I was! I was at a restaurant in the city that is not a sponsor. Uh, so it it was McCormick and Coletto's and, uh, I ordered a Greyhound Mm -hmm. and they, they got this bucket glass. that Mm -hmm. was a big hearty bucket glass that I I thought, oh, that's a great looking glass. And then they chipped off a bunch of ice and they put it in there and their well vodka was Grey Goose Hmm. and they poured Grey Goose in there and then they cut open a ruby red grapefruit and squeezed the whole grapefruit into there. And Mm -hmm. that drink was delicious. And thankfully I was not the one paying for it. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's not kind of unique to San Francisco, but there are a lot of bars and restaurants in San Francisco that make that Greyhound. And I had never drank Greyhounds, mm-hmm. didn't like grapefruit juice. Yeah. But the first time I had one of those <laughs> fresh made Greyhounds at this crappy little dive bar in the Marina campus, I was like, oh, I want to drink six of these. Yeah, right, <laughs> right now. Exactly. <laughs> and it's funny you say a little dive place because you know San Francisco just has this level that you must be yep. to be there. and. Kathleen and I were on, were we on Geary, baby? Waiting, yeah, for, okay. So we just dive into this bar, and it looks like, Jeb, put the axe down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's that kind of place. She orders a margarita, and he just gets out limes and just, you know, starts guy squeezing. with a mustache like this just starts squeezing them and making a, you know, this little dive bar, just a, you know, homemade, yeah. and yeah. it was it was excellent. Yeah, but you paid $18 for it. <laughs> no, it was probably like 13 <laughs> Okay. It was, it was reasonable. All right, but a, when, a reasonable thirteen, yeah, for fresh squeezed stuff. But it's nice to have shaved ice standards. That's really nice. Where what you appreciate is really worth it, and yeah. what you pay for these things. And I mentioned this because you know we were here. We bought a few bottles of wine when we were here last weekend, and everything was just fantastic. I mean, we left here with exactly the experience that you 
mm-hmm. you know, that you are aiming to create, oh, which is you. a connection with the wine, the winemaker that you're here in the land. You know, I mean, we're not sitting in the soil, but it's right there. Yeah. So, so I was going to say, you know, they have this beautiful patio, but also if you come for a second visit, there's a, there's a, a table, table out in the vineyard among yeah. the grapes. And you can also, you know, underneath the tree, you can go out there too. And yep. so then you really can feel the soil. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners who are in the area or planning to travel to the area, you know, when travel becomes a thing again, uh, come out to the Sonoma Dry Creek Valley and, uh, you know, come and and come and pay a visit to this beautiful place. Um, We should tag your website, which is... um, Emmettscorson.com. Okay. So E M M I T T S C O R S O N E dot com. So just like it sounds, <laughs> Emmettscorson.com. Um, there you will see bios on Palmer and Michael, and you'll get a chance to be familiar with the place, and you'll get a chance to do everything that a website allows you to do. So <laughs> yep. go in there and do it. Um, yeah, and come the, out here. Yeah. And, and come call out them here. and schedule to taste some wine. Because yeah, it's by appointment, and by all, appointment. The, all the info is there on the website. And yeah. they are they are COVID uh, compliant. COVID compliant. COVID compliant. Yeah. So uh, it's absolutely yeah, safe. Yeah, Everything's we're kind of, outside. We're kind of COVID compliant all the time. Yeah, all the time. It's, it's always outside. It's always groups of six or less. Yeah, yeah. And there's like always one, only one group here at a one time. One group at a time. So listen yeah. to that. Guy. You know, one group at a time. You will have the entire attention of. Uh, Whoever's pouring for you and just this beautiful view and not have to share with anyone. Just right. your group. <laughs> and whoever's pouring for you is not going to be like a 23-year-old. No, exactly. It's, no, it's, it's me or Michael. Tendon, it's the guys you that made the wine. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. A winemaker, so. Yeah, I was absolutely. He, he's a little better looking than me. I'm a little more charming than him. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the actor he looks like? Yes. Yes, Mark Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> Michael looks him. like Mark Ruffalo. Mark He's Ruffalo got a big, will play big, him. big head of Sicilian hair. Yeah. You know? Okay. All right. Well, all right, ladies, come on out. Um, so, <laughs> seriously though, this is one of the things that we love about this part of the world that is just not something that you can j- enjoy practically anywhere else. No. I mean, in this specific place, is um, you know, it's just magnificent. And it's very affordable yes. to come out and have an experience of this caliber. Mm-hmm. You'll be surprised at how affordable it is. I remember someone told me like the Prince of Dubai yeah. in the early 2000s would come out to Sonoma, fly to Sonoma in his private jet and spend like three or four days in Sonoma and then go back. Yeah. It's funny how often people come to their Napa wine trip that they yep. do every year. Yep. And they're here for three or four days, and, and the tour guide that they hire talks them into on the fourth day, mm. do a day in Sonoma. Mm-hmm. And then they come here, and then they say, we're never going back yep. to Napa Yeah, again. why did we spend those first four <laughs> days in Napa? Yep. That's true. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I'm not here to poo-poo the Napa Valley because it's great a, as a region. A it put, yeah, like exactly. If, if you like Cabernet yeah. mm-hmm. and you got a lot of money to spend— Go to Napa. You're going to have a terrific time. It's a beautiful place. They make the best Cabernet in the world. Mm-hmm. And they'll, um, and they'll help you spend that <laughs> lot of money. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's, you know, obviously great uh, great dining establishments there, but we're, we're coming up in the world here in Healdsburg, too. We have a three Michelin star restaurant now yep. in Healdsburg, Single yep. Thread, yes, we do. and a bunch of other. Three Michelin stars. Really wow. terrific. There's 13, uh, in the, in the 13 or 14 in the country, and there's seven in the Bay Area. Yeah. That's and the rest terrific. are in New York, except for one in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. 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 Wow. So. Well, and, you know, there it's a really easy place to spend several days of vacation. Yep. Yeah. And yep. I can help with that, too. Shoot me an email. I love to uh, turn you on to some other great wineries in the area, send you to visit uh, some of my favorite chefs in the area, and hmm. and uh, give you some ideas for things to do that are, that are not related to food and wine, because there's... Uh, a lot of other great stuff in Sonoma County as well. Hiking, biking, kayaking. Yeah, everything that you would associate surfing. with having a good time in Northern California, yeah. you can have right yeah. here. So if we're looking ahead at the industry and the changes that have happened in the last year, um, does it change your mission at all? Or does it does it uh, change the details of your mission in the coming few years and what you're going to grow here, the wines that you're going to make? 
No, I mean, I think staying small and kind of true to ourselves in the way that we do, um, we hope that it's timeless. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and people are going to discover us. It might set our timeline back a year or two. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but we're going to continue doing things the way we do them. And we think there's always going to be a little niche for, for, uh, you know, small guys who do things well, who do it really well. Yep. Um, people are always kind of searching for that undiscovered gem. And so, you know, we'd like to kind of stay undiscovered. <laughs> yeah. Could, could be a silver lining though, as, the whole as long COVID as thing, possible. Yeah. Is that people are forced to stay a little bit local and they're kind of discovering what's available local that, you know, yeah, I know a lot of people are still, well, and they're, they're becoming, yeah, they're becoming a little bit more used to the idea of, of buying wine online and having it shipped to them, mm-hmm. which helps us a lot because we're not distributed in mm-hmm. 50 states. We're distributed in four states. And mm-hmm. even in those states, you can't get most of the 15 wines we make. You can get one or two. What are the states, by the way? We're in um, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, and Illinois. And then, and then we have uh, a broker here in California that does okay. some trade sales. But mainly, mainly restaurants okay. in all of those places, there's a little bit of Retail. of retail um can you ship to oregon yeah we can okay. we can ship to to a lot of states okay good. um oregon and washington <laughs> are, are easy ones because they have a we have a reciprocal That's arrangement with yeah. the wineries yeah. there yeah. so we don't even need a a license to, sh- to ship there it's great we have yeah have the proper shipping licenses to most of the states that we're allowed to have them in good yeah so it's just kind of uh U- utah uh kentucky west virginia and new hampshire i think are places we can't ship currently but mm-hmm. that's so you, not many yeah you can come here from the east coast you know make your first trip to northern california discover judge palmer and uh go back and enjoy the wine and have it shipped to you yeah absolutely and not, not have to and, say goodbye and have the everybody. greatest story to tell your friends yep. every time you open a bottle yep. yeah and we're doing virtual tastings too which have been a ton of fun you know huh. send people uh Send people a couple of bottles of wine. They either get together in a group with their family at one place, or we log in remotely with friends from all over the country. I've had as many as and then uh, they ni- do the 19, tasting with you as the host. Nineteen people in a Zoom room with me <laughs> tasting the wines, and wow. we all talk about them. Everybody asks questions and tells me what they're tasting, and you know, teach them about about what we do. And it's it's been a ton of fun. Yeah, wow. it's been, that's cool. It's been great. Fantastic. So, can you tell us a little bit about the soil? and how it's different like you said on the hillside is it just because it's higher up in the mountain that it's a different layer of uh you know or is it about drainage and it's mainly about drainage yeah we don't necessarily have a lot of soil diversity within within the vineyard Mm -hmm. here it's all kind of the same slightly gravelly loam they call it laughlin loam up here okay but it definitely is more porous less topsoil much better drainage up on the hillside mm-hmm. and so you get you know smaller berries with more more concentrated flavors because that. they literally are taking up less water exactly okay yeah so in the process the winemaking process what did you have to do what did you have to be sensitive to what you know what we're describe how you honored that harvest with yeah so i mean grenache you know a lot of our philosophies kind of are pretty consistent a- across all the different varieties and that is we do um, what's called spontaneous fermentation with native yeast, which means we don't actually add yeast to the wine. Most most wineries, especially larger wineries, but buy they want to speed the process. They buy cultured yeast from a lab that is going to have a specific kind of impact on the wine, mm-hmm. and we let the native yeast that just come in off the vineyard on the grapes. Wow, we so let you're those tasting. ferment the wines. So every on you're their tasting own. the vineyard. You're and you're, and you know, and, and the people who learn winemaking at UC Davis are taught that that's no, no, <laughs> that that is very risky and you get yeasts that aren't uh, strong enough to complete the fermentation, that aren't able to kind of compete with the spoilage bacteria in the fermentation pro- process. And so you, you know, get wines that won't finish fermentation or that, you know, get lactic acid bacteria or o- other spoilage yeast. And so they, they don't tend to do that the guys who have been trained at at davis but a lot of the kind of renowned um historic wineries in in europe have always done it that way and Mm. still continue to do it that day Mm. and most of the artisan producers like us do it that way and especially there's the big 
natural wine movement going on in the U.S. now. And people don't necessarily agree on all the tenets of natural wine, but that is one that everybody agrees on, you know, native yeast, spontaneous native yeast. fermentation. Wow. wow, that's great. So yeah. we just kind of crush the grapes. Grenache is a pretty thin-skinned grape, so you don't have to really mash it up in the in the crusher like like you might want to do with with cab to extract tannins in fact we try to leave a little bit of this um whole berry where we don't um we don't destem the grapes we leave a small percentage of the whole clusters undisturbed hmm. in the wine and so you get a little bit of kind of earthiness and and tannin from the stems hmm. But what you also get is the, the the grapes ferment a little bit differently because they're not as as exposed to oxygen. So they mm. get a small amount of what's called carbonic maceration. They kind of ferment from the inside out and they give you a little bit more of a fruity flavor profile. So you get a lot more complexity that way. You get both the fruitiness from the carbonic maceration, but you get also some earthiness from the stems and you get these kind of layers of, of complexity in the wine. Mm -hmm. Do you filter all your wines? We don't. We filter most most of the white wines, which you know is one way that we depart minimally from from what would kind of strictly be, be considered natural wine. Although most of our reds are unfiltered, this one is unfiltered. Okay, I don't see much sediment. So yeah, if you you know if you're careful to rack the wines off the lees, mm -hmm. especially if you leave them longer in barrel, give them more time to kind of clarify on their own. I see. Okay. Um, you won't you won't get a lot of uh, of sediment. Is this vegan? It is. I think most most wines are vegan. No, nobody tends to advertise them that way. I thought there was some kind of like eggshell or some kind of process. Something some, that was some people do egg white fining. Although yeah. most commercial wineries these days huh. don't. They do. Okay. They do a bentonite, which is a, a clay based fining. Hmm. There are some some smaller producers, especially in Europe, that still do egg white fining. And we, again, that's part of the reason we don't sort of advertise all our wines as vegan, because we will from time to time do mm -hmm. do egg white fining. But mm -hmm. it's it's pretty rare that we that we do it. Yeah. So that would be one thing that might technically make the wine not vegan, although mm -hmm. the egg whites don't remain in the wine. They kind of, mm -hmm. they bind up to, to solids uh, in solution, and then they drop out and you rack it off. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually leaving any egg whites mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. If it's used in production, I guess maybe that's not. Yeah, if it just technically makes, vegan. it's like declaring can't a vegetable make contact, not vegan yeah. because a cow walked well, by. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> and the other the other one that's pretty common is people use this fish emulsion yes. in the vineyards yeah. to fertilize the vineyards. And I I had a group of six vegans here, and I'm like, well, you tell me what what do you think? Do you think yeah. that's that's vegan or not? They're like, yeah, I guess that would be fine. I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't... know, but technically, if it's going in the vineyard, then maybe it's ending up in the grapes and. You know. So you I know, mean, if like we're the snail that, dies, <laughs> yeah. right, and then yeah. the the, right. the roots absorb it. So there are there are proteins, <laughs> right. there are insects, there are you know animals that are going to be absorbed. So yeah, that's a little bit much, I think. If we're going that far into the technicality, it's probably you know mm -hmm. it's negligible. Mm -hmm. If you're paying that close attention, I respect it. But how about pay close attention to the wine mm -hmm. and the you know what you're getting out of it? Yep, it's delicious. Yeah, and then you know, Grenache is something that is a grape that that makes it pretty easy on you. It it tends to ferment pretty quiet, pretty quickly. You measure the bricks throughout the fermentation. You generally harvest the grapes somewhere between twenty and twenty five, and then you're looking once it starts fermenting. You're measuring every morning that that specific gravity, the basically the the kind of density to give you a, a, an estimate of how much sugar remains in the wine. And and with Cabernet, you're you're really hoping that it moves like two points. Every day, 24, 22, 20, yeah. 18. Grenache will like pick it at, at 22. It'll start fermenting one day. It'll be at 20. And then we'll come in the next morning. It's three. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> just, just goes, just goes hot and fast. And we, you know, and we don't, Volatile. we don't use temperature control. So we're not like setting it at a temperature or heating up the tank to get it. We're, we're letting it make its own heat and it'll it'll make a lot of heat yeah. wow. <laughs> it'll make a it's lot an italian of style yeah. wine with an yeah. italian style temper mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and then we age this in in french oak we used in this wine we made seven barrels of this wine two of the barrels were brand new barrels and five that had been used uh, a couple of times on various different wines so they're kind of more neutral didn't have a lot of that new oak flavor on them and we tend to use barrels for all our wines, even the cab where you want a little bit of that oak, we tend to use kind of lesser toast, tighter grain, stuff that's going to have 
less of a, of an impact in terms of the sweetness and like the real oakiness, what people are used to with like mm. the, the vanilla, that type of flavor. We're looking for barrels that kind of add layers and complexity and, and um, the Bertrange forest in France that we use on this wine has a very floral component to it, very mm. mineral component to it. And those are, uh, those are things that we like in this kind of more delicate style of Grenache. We're not trying to punch you in the face, you know, with a big sweet bomb. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love that it's delicate. I don't think you guys tasted this one last time. Did, uh, did we taste our like new? It. So this is a brand new wine that we just bottled. And Old did, You know, we've Not been doing everything. with a bottle of that. For the last few years in, uh, you know, our <clears throat> Grenache and Grenache Blanc and the Ronin Italian style wines in this um, Domenica Amato label named after Michael's grandmother and our Cabernets and the Judge Palmer label named after my grandfather. And this year we started a third brand, which is the Emmett Scorson brand. And we did some wow, that is Grenache empty. Blanc. We did some um, <laughs> Grenache. Yeah, no and kidding. we did this Cabernet. Mm. And the idea with these wines is that we're going to sell them primarily. The hope is is for more, more retail stores to sell these wines. Our, our Judge Palmer and Domenico wines are priced a little bit higher. They tend to make sense on a restaurant wine list by the bottle yeah. um, or direct to consumer. These wines are aimed a little bit more towards by the glass placements and, mm. and retail stores. So this is uh, going to retail for 30 bucks and you are not going to find a Cabernet anywhere. I, I don't think that tastes like this for 30 bucks. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You are not going to find a Cabernet anywhere. I, I don't think that tastes like this for 30 bucks. And it's mostly, we called it Old Vines, Dry Creek Valley. It's most mostly from oh, the estate. It's not wow. labeled estate because it, it's not 95% from the estate, which it would have to be to be called To be certified uh, estate. estate. So okay. it's about 85% from the property and the rest mm. is Alexander Valley. But it's all cab. But it's all cab. 100% cab. 100% cab, yeah. And aged in not a single new barrel in the bunch. Sure. It's all all barrels that have been used uh, once or twice on our other, other Cabernets. Um, but it's not, it's not lacking for, for yeah. anything, not mm -hmm. lacking for body, for texture, you know, for that, that richness, um, that you get from the oak. It, and man, food. Yeah. Just imagine yeah. food would be so good with this. And I failed to mention that, that we do farm this vineyard organically. It's not certified organic. It's certified sustainable and it's been farmed organically for about the last eight years. What does it mean to be certified organic? $20,000? Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. That's a price tag, yeah. right? That's what I, we're talking about, yeah, the I'm, difference I'm, between price and, <laughs> and uh Exactly. Yeah, I think for a, it just doesn't necessarily pencil out for a small yeah. vineyard like this to go through the go through the process. You know, at some point it may, the marketplace may demand that mm -hmm. certification and we'll have to go through it. But for now, you know, I think people who know us and know the way we do things, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to trust that we're being responsible stewards of the land and, and, uh, and making wines in a way that are that are consistent with the principles of you know sustainability and 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 organic farming. So yeah, I, I mean, I think that hopefully everybody gets the message that your your practices are best practices in right. every way that yep. really mm -hmm. counts for making wine. Yep. And you yeah, know, we, somebody yeah, we else could, we could split hairs on a few certification things, but, on yeah. paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. You know, to get back to the natural wine movement, which is a which is a big big trend there really is no strict definition of what mm -hmm. natural wine is so we don't tend to advertise ourselves as natural wine producers even though we most of the wines we produce would would check mm -hmm. the boxes, most the if boxes. not all of the natural wine boxes mm -hmm. yeah. you know we don't use any additives in the production other than sulfur uh we try to use you know the least amount of sulfur we have to use to mm -hmm. keep keep the wine safe from spoilage. Mm -hmm. Some natural wine use uh, producers will say, "Well, you can't use any," and some will say, "Well, you can use it, but only at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, only right before bottling." Or mm -hmm. and you know, if we're going to use a small amount of sulfur, I don't know why it would matter that we <laughs> if we be, yeah, put it when, in today or yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we're a little bit more um, kind of flexible with our uh, with our approach, but um, again, try to kind of follow the best practices but also not be afraid to 
uh, do something if we feel like it's going to make the wine better, mm-hmm. but it doesn't fit into somebody's ideology of how you're supposed to make wine. Um, you know, we're not going to limit ourselves. Yeah. Um, and most wine uses sulfur, right? Most wineries will use sulfur. Yeah. I mean, all, all but a few really, yeah. really, um, you know, hardcore natural wine producers, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And it's just to protect from spoilage. It has a lot of uses. And that's one of the reasons that, that we don't want to limit ourselves to when we, when we oh, use I see. it. I see. Um, we, we like to use it earlier in the process um, because what the sulfur will do, a lot of this, the spoilage bacteria um are a lot more sensitive to sulfur um than than the yeast um that that ferments the wine Mm -hmm. um so uh, michael's michael's quote is i think sulfur is a great tool in natural winemaking Mm -hmm. because if you can kind of isolate your native yeast Mm -hmm. um and give it a fighting let it thrive yeah yeah um then then you're going to have you're going to be more likely that that native yeast is going to be able to work through the fermentation and not have to add a, a, uh, a culture yeast later on in the process. Oh yeah. Which we, which we, you know, which is more natural. Yeah. Which we all, we basically have never had to do. Like I, I, I don't, you, you can't find an invoice for yeast, for yeast. in yeah. my winery because yes. we never bought it, you know, wow. even wow. to the point where once in a while people say, well, that's impossible. You must get stuck fermentations all the time. And even if we do get a, um, a stuck fermentation, um, you know, we can, we can do a build up just with the population of native yeast in there. We can either, um, you know, we can add sulfur to kill off whatever bad bacteria has grown in there. And then, and then just, you know, isolate a small batch of wine, give it a little bit of heat and get it back going again without having to add a cultured yeast. Mm-hmm. You, know? you know, what'd be great. A, a really peppery short rib, just an mm-hmm. unctuous, unctuous short rib. Mm-hmm. Some kind of red, red meat. Yeah. Some kind of red meat. Yeah, this wine does have a little bit more of a peppery character mm-hmm. um, than a lot of our cabs. Mm-hmm. Mm. Part of that is, I think, maybe not having the... That is kind of the... Um, one of the natural characteristics of cab that is a lot of times um, either masked by the oak or or sort of less present because people in Napa and Sonoma tend to let their cab get really, really ripe before they before they pick it. And this kind of has a little bit more um, of that Bordeaux like vegetal character because we picked it really early. You know, we picked it between the different blocks in the vineyard were picked between 23 and a half and 24 bricks. And normally for cab in Napa and Sonoma, you know, they don't want to talk to you until it's 25. And a lot of people are picking 26, 27 and then adding water back and wow. Yeah. And tartaric acid. And yeah. Hmm. Still a lot of plum in the nose. That's great. Yeah, that that plummy character people associate a lot with with uh, Merlot, but I think it it's definitely definitely present in a lot of these cabs, especially when you pick it pick mm-hmm. it on the earlier side. You get more of the more of that stone fruit character, which I really like in cab. Yeah, absolutely. God, that is terrific. Yeah. I really want virtual tastings to work. <laughs> I hope people get into it because it's a really great way to experience. Um, we'll have to check it out. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, we should really, we should, we should make one and we should invite people from a lot of other places to do it. Hmm. And I'm I trying to think. Who would I buy a bottle of wine for <laughs> and have it shipped? Who's going to open it and appreciate it? And, you know, that list. Um, I had a group of, of women, all my all my old friends from the movie business in L.A. And that, that was the one that ended up growing. We did it. We did eight, eight, like eight out of ten Wednesdays. <laughs> Um, two wines each week, and mm. and one of those weeks we had we had nineteen people wow. in the Zoom room. We just we just had a ton of fun. We yeah, went through like you know every wine we make, and mm. and uh, they learned it. They learned a ton along the way, and we had we had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. we'll have to think about who we want to recruit. Yeah. Ah. Uh. God, as delicious as this tastes, it really smells great. It's got such a great nose. I just sit and 
just sit and live with it. All well, day. I got a little bit left, and it's still mm, aromatic. Still yeah. Mm. Now, is this a port? It is. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I wasn't sure if you had, if I had ever poured that I for you. I don't think we've ever tried yeah. the port. Yeah, so this is this is kind of a a classic, you know, two guys in a barn, you know, <laughs> just just uh running on pure passion, um, getting inspired and doing something really strange, mm-hmm. um, and committing to to a five year process mm-hmm. of of doing it. Um so this is we call this the gavel. And it is um a uh a Madeira style kind of white port made made mainly from sauvignon blanc wow and we age this in what's called a solera so that is a a common aging method in in sherry um it is done with with other spirits um with with some madeira wines um there's actually even a guy up in um mendocino county i think who does a red wine Hmm. uh in in solera um but basically what that means is you're you're um, kind of blending different vintages together over time, and you have this system of barrels. And what you bottom out, uh, what you bottle out of, is the the bottom section of barrels, which are the um, the oldest wines. But you you never bottle the entire barrel. Hmm. You bottle maybe half of it. You fill that up with the wine that's slightly younger. You mm-hmm. fill that up with wine that's slightly younger than that. And then maybe depending on how many layers of your Solera you have, eventually you you fill up the top barrel with new wine. Mm-hmm. Um, this it is makes a, it way down. This is a three year Solera, um, and so it has wine in it from 2014, 2015, and 2016. Um, when so the minimum age is three years, the average age is four years. Mm. Um, but we didn't bottle the whole barrel. So when we bottle it next year, it'll be a mix of 2014, 2015, 2016, and a little bit of 2017. Wow. Uh, and so on. We'll keep going. We'll bottle it every year. And actually we're, we're thinking about, um, maybe, um, expanding it and making it a a four or a five year Solera. So we get a little Mm. bit more Mm. aging, a little bit more of that, that uh <laughs> poached pears <laughs> in a caramel sauce oh yeah and it's kind of we had a little bit of red wine in our glass so you can't so the color got a little bit a little bit tweaked let me uh show you what the color is supposed to look like oh yeah. oh right with poached pears <sighs> in a caramel sauce yeah yeah so the white wine over time you know, oxidizes a little bit, a little bit, and it starts to turn orange, starts to turn mm. brown. Mm-hmm. This is kind of like a, it's not quite amber. It's kind of a, 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 a deep orange, I would say. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's a great so, color. And it's all Sauvignon Blanc. Wow. There's a little bit, a tiny, there's about 5% mm. Semillon in it. Mm. And we did, we started with um, orange wine Sauvignon Blanc that had from, been fermented with the skin, so it started out a little bit orange. Uh, and then do you we pick fork- the grapes later? That is fantastic. I'm sorry. Right. We we didn't. Uh, we are doing that now. Mm-hmm. We, the first couple of years, what happened was we had uh, our skin fermented Sauvignon Blanc that we made in 2014. The last mm-hmm. two barrels that came out of the press mm-hmm. um, had like a very very pungent, very tannic um, feel to them. They just didn't fit with the rest of the Sauvignon Blanc wine that we were trying to make. So we pulled them out of the blend. We didn't know what we were going to do with them. They sat in the winery for a couple of years. Hmm. Um, and then I had this bright idea of, well, let's add some sweeter wine to it and fortify it and turn it into a Madeira. Hmm. <laughs> and so that's what we did. Wow. I do not typically like ports, and this is just yeah. delicious. It's it's really, yeah. There's so many things that it would go well with. Cheese plate, just just grapes, oh, yeah, just like fruit, plate. just strawberries yeah. and grapes. I, I think that the like classic after dinner cheese plate is mm-hmm. what is perfect with this. You, some you, blue you, cheese. You got some some nuts on there. Mm-hmm. Some yeah, yeah. Some uh, assortment of different cheeses. You've got honey some drizzle. honey yeah, on yeah. there. Yeah, maybe yeah. some dates. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Quince paste. You know mm-hmm. all that stuff. Figs. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, all that. All that uh, mm-hmm. um, with this wine, I think is is really the perfect. 
thing. We've we've done a couple of wine dinners with it. This and, is fantastic. And, <laughs> I'm just rejoicing this thing. Yeah. This is amazing. The one thing that's really difficult with it is is chocolate. Oh, yeah, and the first wine dinner I did with it, or not the first, but I did one this year, and and uh, they did a chocolate mousse with it, and I was like, oh mm. no, oh no. And how was it? It was it was not terrific. It wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. I, and fruit, I, I literally I, sat you down. You know, that's the, the thing is else. that we didn't. We went around the. You know, we went right. around the. the and nobody the said room. chocolate. Nobody, nobody said, said chocolate. chocolate right, yeah. and so I, I, I literally, I was doing my rounds at the winemaker dinner. I went around to all the tables, and then I, I sat down and I had my bite of chocolate mousse and and i had my little sip of the gavel and mm. somebody from the the other side of the table was kind of watching me yeah <laughs> and they saw the look on my face they're like what was that what was that look what was that look yeah. <laughs> you didn't like that did you <laughs> wow um but then a couple of weeks later i did another dinner at the uh, uh fort worth club in dallas mm-hmm. and they they nailed it um dang it I'm gonna have to. So first of all, find. how much is this a bottle? This is sixty a bottle, and okay. it's um, a five hundred milliliter bottle, so it's oh. ha- halfway in between a half oh, cool. a half bottle and a full bottle. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna be getting. One. And we made three. <laughs> and we made three hundred bottles. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And we'll, but we'll. The the goal is to kind of continue to make uh, about yeah. that much. Please do year. that. Yeah. Because this shit is magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really good. I mean, you poured us some great wines and we've been talking about great wines and great flavor combinations and all the subtleties. This is just the capper. This is magical. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It, it just kind of exceeded our wildest <laughs> dreams. Isn't that great how though? Yeah. When it's just this, better than you think expect? Could, yeah. could, could ever turn out. Yeah. I mean, what, what really um, stands out to me about this wine is the finish. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you put this in your mouth and you're still tasting it a mm-hmm. minute later yeah a minute and a half later i mean mm-hmm. it is it is an epic finish which to me people say how do you how do you figure out what's a good wine that's mm-hmm. number one the yeah. finish yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. yes i agree and uh god what was i drinking recently that yeah this is so strong it was it a decent you know uh f- attack initially but then it just it, it evaporated it wasn't a bad finish it just evaporated it was just right, gone right. after you know right. three quarters of a second in my mouth. It just yeah. evaporated. It's like I'm I'm missing. And okay, you, you know, got to enjoy it in yeah. the beginning, but this yeah. just it doesn't stays. linger. There should be some linger, you know. And I didn't notice that that's what it was. But I mean, I put my glass down and I'm just breathing in and out mm-hmm. for a little while, and then it hits me again. Like this is so good. We have a bunch of Gravenstein apples we just picked uh-huh. from an apple orchard, and we are. We invited you actually, or yeah, yeah, to Christy. yeah. So we're going to be making apple pies, and I think this mm. with a little bit of ice cream on a fresh, warm slice of apple pie. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm trying to find this the menu from the Fort Worth Club dinner I did. Um, I think there was an it was an apple. I think there was some right. apple in it. Right, that just be yeah. fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. This was a great capper. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm glad you. Uh, this I is what it's like. It. This is this is kind of the experience, you know. That's the funny thing is we've it. been describing this experience to, we to our listeners one. from elsewhere. Yeah. And oh, here it here it is. They nailed it. It was not an apple. It was a Grand Marnier souffle with honeycomb, toasted hazelnuts, uh-huh. and a caramel sauce. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, it was insane. Yeah. It was and it's so the good. toasted hazelnuts yep. that kind of just take yep. it in the direction. Nailed it. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So. So. Come out and see for our listeners. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, it's almost if you did not grow up in this environment, and you know, when I was growing up, my parents ate well and they took us to restaurants and stuff, but we didn't really start to understand the subtleties mm-hmm. until much later. And when you do get into it and you do start to really notice what makes these things important and what makes these things so satisfying. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much of it, I've said a few times during this show, is right here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and th- and there's there's a wine for everybody too. Yep. Yeah, you know, I, I think people who don't like wine yet, they just haven't had their aha yeah. moment. You know, they just you just got to keep getting them to try new things because so there's something grapes. that'll yeah that'll, that'll provide click. that spark for them. You know, someone's grown a char or charbono. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can you can get a hundred percent right. charbono, right? If you look for it from California, yeah, and that you know that's um, 
kind of always been my number one philosophy in wine, which I, I got from my friend, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, which is, you know, you, you have to try new things mm -hmm. constantly. Known How for many things, know? but also a wine guy, by the way, Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> yeah. So, because, you know, he, he always put it this way, like, how would you know that pizza is your favorite food if yeah. you never had pizza? Right. <laughs> right. You know, so if you've never had a petite Syrah, if yeah. you've never had a Madeira, mm -hmm. if you've never had a Fiano, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you know? You might, yeah. you might love it. You know? Well, I always thought my least favorite wine was port. <laughs> but I, well, in, that's the other thing. I like, am in love. Yeah. You're one, you know, maybe you just haven't had the right one that's of those right. things. And, Absolutely. And, and your palate evolves over time too. You know, yeah. things that I loved. 15 years ago, you know, I don't, I don't drink as much of yeah. it anymore. Remember when blush wines weren't taken seriously? Like rosés? <laughs> oh, really? You're doing it? Everyone's doing a rosé now. Yeah. And it's, it's become its own, you know. It's a giant market. <laughs> and right? It, it can, huge. And it and can just, be done well, and, you know, turns and, yeah. out. And you can have rosés that look almost crystal clear and then ones that are, you know, almost darker than a Pinot I and mean, just the whole gamut. And they make them from any grape. Rosé of pure cab, you know, just, yeah, <laughs> someone turned yep. that into a rosé. So, but um, I think the best of them are excellent. Yeah, I think there's, you know, a time and a place for every wine. And mm -hmm. you, you guys know, have a rosé too. We, we've we made one. Michael's not a big rosé uh, fan. Did, I thought we got a rosé. We, maybe our we've one. made one um, a couple of years. We did, we did uh, a Grenache Syrah rosé. We did a Grenache rosé. We did a Malbec rosé one year. Hmm. This past year, we did kind of a combination rosé slash uh, Beaujolais style Grenache, mm -hmm. which may have been what I poured you last time you were okay. you were here. Yeah, I thought I remember right. Yeah. Didn't we get a bottle of it's it? It's a or? little bit darker. It's not like okay. dark like the regular Grenache, but it's it's got a little bit more more tint to it. Hmm. What? Fresco. Fresco. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. We did get a bottle of it, didn't we? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that was our that was our uh, kind of compromise on mm -hmm. on making a quote unquote rosé. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of times, you know, some rosés are what they call intentional rosés, which is you know the grapes are yeah. grown and harvested specifically because they're going to mm -hmm. become rosé, and then there are what they Oops. call sanniers or bleeds, which where the rosé is a byproduct of red wine mm -hmm. production, um, in order to concentrate the juice in your red wine so it has more exposure mm -hmm. to the skins you bleed some of that some of that um unfermented pink juice out of the tank some people can just pour it down the drain or so or you can make it into rosé <laughs> yeah know? i cannot believe how goddamn good this port is oh, okay. <laughs> this is so good right you're just savoring it ah uh, yeah i should have savored mine more well, I can pour you a little more. I'm breathing right. it in. Uh, just a little bit. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, and now you get, you get the, the true experience of the color here because you don't have any red in there. Oh, that's there. wonderful. And by the way, you know, to, to, to the listeners, if you've ever gone wine tasting in Napa, you do not know what the experience is about. And uh, you get well taken care of here. I call them you Napa should say, pours. No, you in should Napa, say if, if you've only tasted yeah, if in you Napa, only tasted Napa, you have no idea what this is. You don't know. I, mean, the I Napa promise pours, you. It's like they, uh, there are a lot of people out there who say, it. oh, I go wine tasting all the time. Yeah. I come up Highway 29 and I pop mm -hmm. by this place and that place. Yep. And I appreciate that you're having a great time. But I promise you, mm -hmm. it's nothing like this. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this is the, it's, it's not quite our, our home yet, but mm -hmm. you know, the experience we want to provide is that, you know, you're in our home. Yeah. yeah. I could drink this with a caramel apple. Mm -hmm. That's what I was saying. Like a, the apple pie, baby. Apple pie with ice cream, huh? Right. Did, did you miss the cheese? I, she, she likes the cheese idea. Did you miss yeah. the, uh, the pairing that I had in Fort Worth? Where did you did you leave for a second? Or did that? you hear the? Yeah. It was a Grand Marnier souffle with toasted hazelnuts and caramel and sauce honeycomb. Mm -hmm. and honeycomb. That was the like right. bomb pairing yeah. with this wine. Yeah, man. I'm gonna send that to every place I do a wine dinner from now on. Yeah. So here, I don't care how hard it this. is. Make a souffle. <laughs> <laughs> Find a honeycomb. <laughs> We've done a couple of wine dinners locally. We'd like to we'd like to do more. Uh, yeah. We're we're talking to a couple of our friends. We'll about, build you a table. Doing them, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. You and I get together yeah, and build we've a twelve person we, table. We we've done them at uh, at A sixteen in San Francisco. We're good friends with the owner of Shelley there. 
we'd uh we'd like to we'd like to do well, I haven't been there in a while. Yeah. We haven't done any up here yet, but we're going we're going to. We're working on it. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're working on doing something with Mateo in mm. town here, mm. who's a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever go to um Harvest Moon in Sonoma before it closed? I don't know. Michael's Michael's close with the couple that own that and they have right. this new little place that's they have a family now, so they didn't want to be in the restaurant every night of the week. So they have more of a kind of breakfast and lunch slash bakery kind of yeah. spot now. But we're talking about doing some some pop up dinners with them. It'd be great. Yeah. You know what might be pretty interesting, and I'm just spitballing. But if you had developed a partnership with small wineries that were close by, and then there was a, a you know like a tasting menu that took the better part of you know the latter half of the day, where somebody would showcase one or two wines with one or two pairings and then you'd mm-hmm. go to another place for one or two wines and one or two mm-hmm. pairings and it would just be a showcase for it, you know it would be a an experience a total experience that somebody would organize mm-hmm. yep but it would span a few different wineries yeah. and a few different chefs mm-hmm. that would be pretty amazing yeah that, that would, would be would amazing be quite a day yeah. get on yeah. that yeah <laughs> <laughs> make it happen wow yeah well that was fantastic. thank you again palmer uh, for pouring the uh, the wonderful nectar and that that's the great way and to for cap. making the wonderful nectar yes, and, and for, for the and for living by principles in your business mm-hmm. that create this, this very special product because thank you that's what we wanted to showcase mm-hmm. was that you're here living a very particular dream that has everything to do with being the absolute best at a craft that is very very finite yep and, and labor intensive and cost intensive yeah you know yeah yeah. And I mean, when you talk about how it's you and Michael making the wine, I mean, that's two guys just getting dirty. You're racking yep. all the barrels. Yeah. Yeah. No, and no, we, yeah, no and hiring we're... someone else to come in for just a couple of weeks and rack the barrels. Nope. Let's get out yeah, there and we live do, this thing. Yeah. Bam. We do bring in one extra set of hands for the harvest because it's, okay. it's a lot of, that a makes lot of work. Okay. Sure. Um, one extra yeah. set of hands. Yeah. Not a team. Right. <laughs> one person. Yeah. So you're out there picking the grapes. We do uh, occasionally. We'll pick small lots in the vineyard on our mm-hmm. own. All the work we do ourselves is in the winery. Generally, okay. yeah. we have a uh, hire a picking crew mm-hmm. right. in this, and vineyard they do that for a living. And all the other grapes yeah, yeah. that we buy from other vineyards and, and, are. And it, what the price we pay includes the 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 harvesting of the grapes. And it's you know, I've, Kathleen and I have seen a couple documentaries, and it's a skill. It's not just come up to the grape and pick it. Yeah. I uh, learned there. They've got knives and they have to decide which fruit to fall and which not. And sometimes actually make even snipping and clipping decisions. And uh, it's like, a, it's not just go and take <laughs> take the grapes. It's, would, yeah, you, no. would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the quality of your crew can mean a lot for the quality of the wine, especially mm-hmm. in our winery where yeah. we don't have a sorting table with eight people. Yep sorting the grapes before they go into the tank mm-hmm. yeah you know we we basically have whatever comes in what from comes the vineyard gets to the tank gets into the tank so so they uh, themselves so we, so we rely experience. on on the crew to mm-hmm. to only <laughs> pick the best stuff and yeah. we're out there in the vineyard and making sure mm-hmm. say hey you know pointing out clusters don't pick mm-hmm. the ones that look like this mm-hmm. yeah you know and if one ends up in the in the bin we're mm-hmm. hang, hanging out on the uh on the tractor you know Grab you get to say in real time, like, them hey, out. not this Toss one, guys. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I want to tell our listeners, the funny thing was when we arrived here uh, for our tasting the other day, mm-hmm. we walked in and we had to go to the bathroom. Pete and I went to the bathroom and we walked by the bathroom and he pointed at the gear and went, that's the wine. That's where the wine's made. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were able to see, and it's not like you're in a factory no. No. with great big vats of no. stuff and, you know, industrial mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's there's no yeah the industrial revolution has not hit this process yeah well you have to come it's up in about batch. six weeks and once we have a full winery full of tanks and see what it looks like when we <laughs> yeah you know when we're really rocking and rolling that whole space is just filled with filled with tanks and <laughs> we're doing punch downs kind of all day every day and yeah. wow a lot of action a lot of a lot of smells that's my favorite thing about winemaking coming in in the morning and smelling the fermentations mm. it's uh oh it's wow really special yeah uh, cool Okay. Well, we got a great post trip here. Yep. And I think that uh, this was an amazing visit. And, you know, we'll punch up the website and we'll get it in there. But it's uh, Emmett Scorson. And uh, look him up. Come out to the Sonoma Valley. Have this experience, everybody. Yep. 
you won't you won't be disappointed. You will not be disappointed. Right on. <laughs>